All right, go ahead. Go, Michael. We doing a countdown? Oh, yeah, we're, we can go live now. You're ready to go. Okay. Thank you, everyone. We still haven't gotten the like this down to a science, even after 15 months, but we're getting there. Um, I am going to call this meeting of the Dix Leadership Committee um, to order. Um, and first order business is public comment. Do we have Doug on the line today? We do, yeah. Now's the time if you'd like to make a comment to uh, use the raise hand function on Zoom. Um, and our first one is Doug Johnson. Doug, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Good afternoon. Good, Good afternoon, Doug. I was reading the Knight Foundation report that was issued last month on the power of public spaces in the country and remembered the question that constantly comes to my mind, is there anything as special as what's happening here, any place else in the world? I've Googled it, there's none, not even close. Something so special comes to a few professionals and civic leaders like yourselves, rarely if at all, taking something already sort of a park and making it a 21st century one. I love it. And I love the leadership committee and community and everything it does. I love, I love the engagement process, especially the time and attention paid to me by everyone, uh, especially on the leadership committee. But uh, we've got to stop meeting like this. <laughs> Sorry. Attending these meetings, I hear what's happening at Dick's Park, but not what any of you individually want to be felt and understood about Dick's Park and why the project and its values are special to you. And maybe along the way, how they impact my constant two themes, which are first outside the park, like the great prospects for the park campus coalescence that we expect, can expect, I think, to arise from the Centennial Campus carefully crafted rezoning. Olmsted says it's a common error to regard a park as something to be produced, produced complete in itself. And this uh, is the test case for that doctrine, I guess. Second, clutter in the park, like necessary and often relatively minor things that might be emblematic of wider concerns and opportunity. And uh, I've sent some information on parking lots and shade shelters, which are probably uh, the most routine example of that concern. But again, Olmstead says whatever withholds attention from a park's simple, broad, open space of clean greensward is in effect a blemish, however necessary or art artful in itself. And we have certainly the talent to uh, avoid that uh, in every possible way. So now that I'm vaccinated and remembering our conversations following the master plan executive committee meetings two years ago or more, I'm inviting each of you for a dialogue in the park at your convenience and on short notice, if necessary, just text me and you'll find my phone number on any of the earlier emails I sent. And since some of it of our discussions may wind up as the result of a project I'm anticipating in a course I'm taking next semester with Chuck Flink at State. If you don't feel it's appropriate for you to be mentioned in that, then that gives you a polite way of saying no thanks uh, to my invitation, uh, certainly given your time and other priorities and all the listening that you do to me anyway. I know that thanks no is a perfectly understandable 
and suitable response. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Do we have anyone else, Michael, for public comment? It does not look like there's anyone else that needs to say anything. Okay, well then we will start with the welcome. Um, happy to have everybody here today. Um, and I feel like some things have happened the past few weeks that have really um, moved us forward. And I wanna thank everybody for um, their dedication to this park and what we're about to embark on. So um, the first order of business is the community committee. Um, Shauna, do you have an update for us? It's very brief, so y'all are welcome um, compared to last month. And we, we did take um, the feedback to prepare a report moving forward. So we'll be working with Nick and Kate and other people from the city and conservancy team to do that. But uh, three things, uh, the task force continue to uh, push work forward around park equity planning, park partnerships and early park improvements. Uh, so we'll have that in a more formalized written update. And our next meeting will have a plaza and play focus and be the primer for the project's third and final public meeting. So that's upcoming as well. And then third, I have already agreed to meet Doug Johnson for a walk and talk at the park. So shame on you, Doug, for not thanking me, but we'll get that going um, and we'll get that feedback to y'all too. Thank you. And there's Corey. Thanks for joining us. Okay, that was brief. So next we have the implementation plan. Great, thank you, Mayor. And this, um, this will be a presentation and discussion tag teamed by myself, staff, and uh, Matt and Adrian from MBBA. Thank y'all for joining us here. Um, but over the past months and weeks and, and really years, we've been talking about how to move this project forward and what information does the leadership committee need to help make decisions? And I'm gonna share my screen and just um, go through a few slides and then hand it over to MBBA. Because there has been a lot of thought in this, um, in this discussion. So can y'all see implementation plan across, across the screen? Great. So just as a, a reminder, the master plan was adopted in February of 2019. And then the fall of that year, we gave a series of presentations to Raleigh City Council um, on the phase one implementation plan. And that was basically a document that highlighted all of the phase one projects and the phase one plans and studies to help us move the project forward. Now that winter and early spring, there was a change in um, parks leadership. There was a change um, with the conservancy leadership. There were elections and a new mayor and new council. Uh, in March of last year, there was the pandemic, which had a ripple effect everywhere. And so I think it's a, a great time for us to revisit the implementation plan and really think strategically about how we're going to build this park over time. And so what I provided in the pre-meeting packets, as well as we'll highlight here, is the road to implementation um, that we want to have start the discussion today, but realize this is going to be an ongoing discussion with the leadership committee. Um, and just as a reminder, the master plan did an amazing job of establishing this framework to guide the future of Dix Park. And the implementation plan is the set of projects and plans and studies needed to advance the project to resolve issues that were potentially identified in the master plan but not resolved and to set us up for future success. So what I, and showing right now on the schedule is the idea of currently how we're thinking about how phase one projects phase over the next, um, next five years and how plans and studies set up our future successes and set up um, this committee with the right set of information to help make decisions to move the project forward. Um, just to highlight a couple of pieces, You've noticed there are some green dots at the top. This could be potential funding cycles, public funding opportunities. You notice that in July of 2025, the DHHS lease expires, but we know they may request an extension. 
So it's really trying to line up these key decision points across the process so that everyone has a sense of where we are and where we're going. And we'll get into a little more detail about this as we move forward. But the colorful blocks are the projects. So these are the things identified in the master plan as phase one projects. And then the grayed out boxes are the plans and studies needed to provide information to this group, to provide information to the community committee, to help inform decision making moving forward. And we'll touch on all of this um, in greater detail through this presentation. Um, so I wanna throw it over to Matt and Adrian just to kind of kick us off on a discussion of the evolution of phasing and projects in the master plan and, and why they are what they are. So um, Matt or Adrian, I will throw it over to you. Okay, Kate, thank you very much. Um, and thank you all for having us come here. We love helping to move the, all of this kind of thinking along, obviously, for many reasons, but because we really love Dick's Park and want to keep, keep it going. So anyway, um, from the master plan, and we're doing a little bit of, it's a little remedial maybe for some of you, and some of you might not have heard it before. So we're just, uh, you know, forgive us if it's but we're trying to like bring everybody up to speed about what was in the master plan and what we've kind of been thinking about since then. So when we were thinking about phasing in the master plan, uh, we had a few things that were driving us. Um, one was this idea that the edges were the important thing at first. So kind of working from the edges in seemed to be a good strategy because you know the edges are the nearer the nearer spaces. Um, so that's what you see first. And then also, as you guys know, some of the more challenging things, some of the difficult buildings to deal with and things like that are up in the top in the middle. So the more you learn about a project, the more you kind of know how to deal with the harder parts. So this is, you know, a kind of double fate, double uh, idea there. Then the other thing is DHHS is in some of the buildings. So we could start to think about earlier phases being things that we could do when they're still here and later phases when we when we get rid of them finally. Uh, and then, um, you know, and then thinking about how the, the phases could build excitement, one builds on the other. So thinking about adjacencies and kind of um, synergies that can happen between things. Um, and therefore we can start to uh, think about things geographically that way as well, instead of kind of like scattering, you know, little improvements all over the place. A lot of this has to do with some of the things that we've learned um, through phasing other projects that we've worked on. Next, Kate, please. So I'm gonna go through the master plan phases briefly just to kind of summarize them for you and then our, a little bit more on our later thoughts. So um, what we had proposed for phase one uh, in the master plan was, uh, was, the, was the gateway project, uh, which is called Plaza and Play now. So you can see that's number four here. Um, and because we thought that was a really important welcoming moment and there aren't any DHHS, uh, you know, occupation going on there and other, many other reasons that we laid out in the master plan. Then the chapel was a, a, a piece that was uh, on the books to uh, possibly um, uh, work with and then the stone houses. So the idea of kind of creating a movement from those buildings and down to the creek, which was a very, very popular item in terms of improving the nature of the site. Um, and uh, so we, we looked at that and then we understood also, something happened, oh, there you go. Sorry. Then we, that's okay. And we also, I thought it was me. Um, then we also, you know, learned a lot about the landfill, which is that big green area to the north there and how that was a linchpin to so many things and how it's tied in with the creek and how it's tied in with, with the meadow expansion. So. We, and, and also it's a place that's, you know, popularly used now as soccer playing. So those things all became a kind of a, a, a phase one. And again, they, they abided by this idea of a coming in from the edges and kind of creating a new entry. Then in phase two, what we were looking at was uh, other, the other edges, you know, the, the lower meadow um, and uh, <clears throat> these, these anticipated some building vacancies here but the lower meadow along uh, by, the fire, by the farmer's market, um, uh, expanding the big field as it's called, 
um, and, and starting to kind of uh, build on what would be a, would have been completed in the, in the in the in the um, landfill area, which is the big yellow area. Now that's completed park in this diagram, and then the green would build on that. And then so you can see along the grove along the, the southeastern section, we were kind of building up from the creek there and expanding towards the middle, and then also then along Lake Wheeler Road, kind of building in from the edges again and kind of saving the middle. And for all of the reasons that I explained. Um, another, uh, a third phase, uh, which was the theater outdoor performance area. This one was one that was tied to the area that the power plant is in for DHHS. So it couldn't be done earlier, although it could be kind of a little bit independent of the first two other phases. We kind of like the idea of doing this one as soon as possible after um, phase one. Um, it, so it could have gone before phase two in this one because it adds a kind of programmatic complement to the things that we saw we would have already had in phase one and phase two with this kind of uh, large uh, uh, kind of destination with the, with, the, uh, with the theater and adding a, lunch, a bunch of parking. And then also we have this kind of tremendous idea of this kind of connection between the two halves of the park that crosses over the railroad, um, which is part of that phase. So that would also uh, uh, provide needed connection as well. And you can see all that's left now is this little gray island in the middle. Um, and so that, that would work out nicely that way as well. Yes, please. And then finally, we could, we could go up to the old original hospital buildings and we, and, and we have ideas about you know, what were the, the ones that we wanted to keep there and we could kind of bring all of everything that we learned all the way around this thing and kind of bring it in and, and kind of one of the great things about the last phase is you could do everything that you kind of, you, you're missing in the earlier phases and kind of complete the project. And so, and since that was gonna kind of create, that was gonna probably require the longest term thinking, the deal making that might be involved and other things, it seemed best to, to kind of let that you know, let, give you the most time to think about that. Next, please. So what we've done um, is, uh, this was the, the, the phase one that was, was presented as a potential phase one um, back in uh, uh, fall of uh, 2019. This is, you know, highlighting the same phase one that I just showed you, but we're highlighting parts of the master plan just to show you what they would, what they would be. So it, it's the Plaza Play, it's the Creek and Landfill and the Land Bridge, it's the cemetery, um, it's uh, some of the historic entry buildings and some uh, multi-use uh, paths and then it, utility improvements that would be needed. And based on- Yeah, yeah, yeah go Sorry, for it. So, no, no, yeah, so kind of based on what I mentioned around kind of the, the park spot and the change, everything that we were kind of working on, there was a bit of a pause and the Conservancy stepped forward and offered to fund a couple of projects early. And those were the design of the Plaza Play and the rehabilitation of the All Face Chapel. So out of that set of early projects, the Conservancy really fronted some money to get a couple of the phase one projects off the ground and moving. And then I think all of you are aware that we worked together with the Conservancy to get grants to fund the creek and landfill feasibility work. So while we are kind of, um, while a lot of things were put on pause because of the Conservancy and the grants that we were able to secure, we were, we were, we were still able to move some project priorities forward this past year, which I think is, is really great. Um, but it hasn't stopped our thinking on what's next. And so Matt, back to you. Yeah, and that momentum that the project kept up, I think it might have been the most important thing really in terms of, you know, cause there's nothing worse than a plan that just sits on the shelf and isn't acted on. So that was a really great thing that happened. Um, you know, so again, refining on the thoughts of what um, might be next. Um, we again thought about things that would happen before the HHS and then after. This is a little bit kind of maybe refining a little bit on those phasing. And then also something happened and why don't we go to the next slide, Kate. Um, you know, one of the things that happened in our Plaza Play investigation and people who have been following that design know about this 
we proposed during the design process that Plaza Play basically kind of grab onto the, what's called the Grove space, the sort of the beautiful space that's to the, uh, towards downtown that exists um, as, the, as part of the Dix Park site now. And it essentially is like a park already. And so to us, it felt like while we were working on Plaza Play to develop Plaza Play as an island disconnected on all sides would not be as good um, a project. And, and we decided, you know, much to our own detriment, not much to our own detriment, but you know, with a little peril because we were gonna expand the area um, uh, and make the project still work on budget, we expanded the area and we connected, we came up with an idea that really connects the Plaza Play to the Grove. So the kind of first phase of opening with the Plaza Play project will feel much bigger and kind of um, take on this borrowed landscape of the Grove and really um, build out on that adjacency idea that I talked about earlier. So picking up on that and then thinking about where the chapel is at, and everybody knows where that is, it's the pink building right there. What we thought and thinking on that earlier project, that earlier idea, we thought, well, maybe we could, even if we, if we leave the creek alone or we let the creek proceed on its own, on its own schedule, because it will be a complex project tied into a lot of things. How about if we, if we kind of moved uphill a little bit and we thought about expanding the grove to the north and bring and, and building some new parking, which would become swing spaces to kind of get some of the DHHS parking that's kind of on the site right right downhill of the chapel right now. So all of you've been to the, you know, the, there's a big parking lot just downhill of the chapel. And it sort of kind of cuts the chapel off from the grove. And then there's a bunch of little houses there also. So our idea is get rid of the houses and move that parking out and, and swing the people, the, the state employees that are parking in that area to a, what will be a future parking lot or what will be a parking lot that will be part of the park eventually, which is which is which we propose in the master plan that's up along the railroad tracks there. So you could see it highlighted. And then um, that kind of follows through on this geographic kind of uh, center of gravity idea that I kind of mentioned already. Also this idea of building out the front in a way that really makes the park feel very complete. What's nice about an idea like this, I think is People will come and visit this thing. And if they don't know a darn thing about the master plan or anything else, they might think this is it. I mean, and this is great. And this is wonderful. And it would feel like a whole thing, even though more good things are coming. And that's always the kind of position you want the public to be in. Um, so just the next slide, Kate, just to highlight what we're talking about. It's also a priority of ours to shuck some of these buildings as soon as possible because they're expensive. And Kate will go over that with you and you know these little houses i also call them attractive nuisances because unfortunately <laughs> little house people can always come up with something to stick in a little house and then you're stuck with this problem you know and so the idea of and those houses were stuck in what was an, a continuation of the grove in the original site plan so our idea is to get rid of those keep all the beautiful trees that have been planted around the houses so it's, it's a lot of demo in this, in this phase and not a ton of construction, which is also nice. And what it does is it connects the, cat, it, it connects the chapel, it, it, it gives us new parking. It, it really kind of makes the whole front of the park kind of feel complete. Another thing that we would like to do is look at the Brown building as a park supporter of use, which is highlighted as a green I-shaped building here in the plan. And um, with that, I think that uh, I am switching over back to Kate now. We, we went backwards. Sorry, I was muted. Let's just pause here for a moment and okay. see if there are any questions or discussions um, to Matt and Adrian around kind of this shifting of projects and phases compared to um, what was originally envisioned in the master plan. This is Corey, I have a question. Um, Mayor, I can, we can't hear you, Mayor. Oh, yeah, I can't see anybody with the screen up. Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you. All right, Councilor Branch. 
Yes. Um, for the homes that we're looking to now remove, did we originally have any um, plans for those homes that have to be reprogrammed? No. They, okay. were, they were part of the buildings that we were going to demolish from the master plan. Okay. Yep. Do we have any other questions? Um, I, I have one question on the map where you have um, extension of the chapel and then you had outdoor amphitheater. Is that, are you moving the plans for the other one or is this something new that's just sort of built into the ground or? Yeah, that's a great question, Nancy. We, it was actually a kind of more, it's a smaller gathering space that we had in the master plan. Um, and, uh, you, you could, it would fit in nicely there. It gives us a smaller gathering space that would not compete with the 8,000 uh, seat space that we want to have on the other side, but um, it would be kind of just a nice place to hang out in the park, but then also a nice spot for maybe a few hundred people, not thousands. Mm -hmm. Much more of a landscape feature, but a gathering space as well. Corey? So for the amphitheater space, is it something that I know there's been a lot of talk about the African American um, Cultural Center and its location. Is this, you know, a option, a possibility for it to be around that amphitheater if it was so choose to? Is that the thinking? Yeah, it could be used as an outdoor classroom, which I think the original African American Center had. Um, it could be used for that as a kind of a, a shared use, you know, it, it would work mm -hmm. nicely that way. Yeah. Okay. If I could just add, that was a part of our conversation years ago, Council Member Branch, this idea that there'd be some kind of connection to adjacent inside building uses with this exact location, kind of on this hillside downslope of the chapel for something like an outdoor amphitheater. So as Matt already mentioned, it was always thought of as a little bit smaller in size than what we had been proposing on the other side of Dix Hill, which was around the power plant area and would be more of a like several thousand person um, a gathering space but this this area on the uh, on the slope here down slope of the chapel as you all know has a really incredible view of downtown and so that was also something we were responding to that there's a way to orient this outdoor amphitheater so that it also kind of celebrates views through the grove and views back down to the Raleigh skyline okay thank you okay everybody all set all right let's continue so that's kind of the, the evolution of thought on, on the project side. And we'll continue to talk about this as the, the bond moves forward and other funding sources are identified to move project work forward. But the other thing that we wanted to bring up, which I think is top of mind for um, everybody is that we also need information to help support decision-making for this group. So, during the master plan process, a number of data points were identified. You know, the, the amount of money that DHHS spends every year on campus maintenance and operations is around $12 million in 2017 dollars. Um, MBBA went through a pretty thorough analysis of numerous building scenarios, looking at rehabilitation and demolition and future use. And, you know, that number ranged anywhere from 100 to 240. $40 million. Um, we also know that there is a lot of interest from community organizations looking for a future location in Dix Park. And we also understand that those partnerships really might provide an opportunity not to only reduce the maintenance and operational burden of the city with the buildings, but also there might be opportunity to produce revenue support revenue to support the future park. And so all of these questions, or all of these were ideas were identified in the master plan, but additional work is needed to move this discussion forward. So in the implementation plan, we have identified a couple of studies, um, a building and infrastructure analysis, which I'll get into in a little bit more detail, that leads into a discussion of funding models and a governance framework. And uh, 
the city is currently working on a funding source to pull that work forward because of the opportunities that have presented themselves recently and also the need to start this work so that the city is prepared to be a good steward of the asset because all of this is coming to us um, in a fairly short time frame. Um, the first thing that, uh, the one thing Billy Jackson, who is our, um, he is in our facilities and operations group always asks me is what's going on with the buildings. And this is a way for us to gather the information, develop the process so that we can start to answer those questions that we keep getting asked from both our community partners and our internal stakeholders. So those plans and studies are proposed. The third piece here is also we are working with the Conservancy on trying to secure some grant funding for a public art and interpretation master plan. There are two things we know. Um, there is a lot of interest in public art in the park and there is a need to figure out how to use art as one tool to interpret the history of place. And so the Conservancy and city teams are working collectively to put some applications together to find some money, to hopefully move that work forward as well. Um, but on the building and infrastructure side of things, I did want to share some information that was developed during the master plan process, but not fully um, shared with, uh, not fully shared because of the point we were in the process. But MBBA has done a lot of work looking at buildings, looking at precedents, and has proposed different levels of intervention from minor rehabilitation to major redesign and reconstruction and has put prices to those things. And this is what we want to evaluate and vet in the building and infrastructure analysis moving forward. They even took it a step further to look at potential programmatic uses for the buildings. So for example, um, in some of the old warehouses, does it make sense to potentially rehabilitate them as either maker space or a food hall? And so as we are getting closer to a transition of buildings from DHHS, and as we are getting interest from a lot of community groups, we need to take a step forward to identify the buildings that should be rehabilitated and reused, affirm what was presented in the master plan, and develop the process for the leadership committee and ultimately council to make these decisions on how to move forward with buildings and partnerships. Um, and directly from that discussion feeds a financial model. So NVDA in partnership with HRNA and others in the master plan also looked at how do the buildings potentially support ongoing park operations and maintenance. And in one scenario, they model, you know, the buildings are, a lot of them are demolished and some of them become maintained and operated by partners and some become maintained and operated by the city. And so this is just looking at different financial scenarios resulting from building scenarios that then lead to a discussion of how much is it gonna to cost to operate this park on an annual basis. And you have scenario one that looks at no on-site contributions, no earned income supporting park operations and continues to different scenarios that start to provide funding for park operations. And so this would be the second part of the building and infrastructure study would be to look at these funding models and how earned income can support park operations and maintenance. But I did want to note that MVBA already put us ahead of the game here with a lot of thinking on this. And the important thing to note with this building piece is that it's from a park perspective, right? This was always intended to be a park first and to have the buildings support the park operations. Um, and so from this park first perspective, from this public benefit perspective, what are the different opportunities for building reuse? And then how does that feed into a funding model that then sets up the city and the conservancy well to be able to successfully operate this park over time. And then from that funding model, 
Typically, when parks like this are established, the funding model informs the governance and partnership structures. So this would be the third layer of the study that we're proposing. So it's looking at infrastructure and buildings, then it's looking at the funding model, then it's looking at the governance to help manage all of the real estate assets um, in the park itself. And it's this layered approach in this next scope of work that we hope to advance because of all of the reasons that we just identified. So it's the building and infrastructure analysis that leads into the funding model, that leads into this discussion of the governance, and that the leadership committee would be involved in all of this discussion as it moves forward. But we, there is some work to be done here. So I want to pause there and just, again, open it up for discussion. But going back to that kind of business case of why we need to do this work and what is this next scope of work that we're proposing to move forward. Okay, um, who has questions relating to this? Shauna? Thank you, Mayor. Um, Kate, I'm assuming you or MVVA have already kind of looked at best practices from other parks that have had done this. Is there a way to share that out? Because I think that's going to be really helpful in thinking through a park that's meant to be a park, but then how do you build it out with intentional and strategic business opportunities, supporting the entrepreneurs, feeling inclusive, all those things. I think, you know, this is a really delicate thing to navigate considering the year we've just come out of. Um, so I would love to have any resources shared. Sure, and Adrian, feel free to jump in here. Um, there was a number, there were a number of case studies done as part of the master plan process and the community committee park partnerships group is also looking at case studies. So I think a good next step would be to share that information with the leadership committee as it um, as as background because there are a number of different models nationally and it's about figuring out what's right for Dick's Park. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely, I, I would say uh, during the master plan phase as well, one of the things that MVVA was really purposeful about was introducing models either on our other projects or through other park professionals that we know around the country to members of the then executive committee. Um, so uh, at that time, uh, we had presentations from uh, folks like Adrian Benefi from the Trust for Public Land, I think at the time, um, as well as uh, representatives from other MVVA projects like our project in Tulsa and Brooklyn. So um, in some ways, you know, each city needs, and each, each location, of course, um, needs to kind of determine their own model for this partnership that works really well with the local community and responds to the needs there. But one thing, one aspect of that that we find really helpful is um, giving, giving some more time um, to you all in Raleigh with some of these really amazing individuals who have done similar but different projects in other cities. So we can continue with that. I think that's, that's really helpful. Orange. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to ask the city, what, what would be the benefit to keeping some of these buildings? Why wouldn't we want to reduce the footprint of city owned built buildings because of the cost of maintenance? So I'm just asking why, why would we keep any of these buildings? Um, and I'll invite anyone else to speak. You know, one of the the great things about the master plan is that it did significantly reduce the number of buildings proposed to be kept and, and retained really the historic core that's within the National Register Historic District. Um, I think this is a good conversation. It, it reduced, uh, you know, currently we have about 1.2 million square feet of building space and the MBBA proposal reduced that significantly and proposed only keeping 32 different buildings. And those buildings were really meant to support the park in its future evolution. We're unique as a large park site that we have buildings already here. And so it was about being kind of authentic to place, preserving the historic core and then demolishing a number of the buildings and turning it back into green space. Um, Adrian, would you add anything else? I would just say on a site this big, there are some benefits to having buildings and with people in them. 
Um, so uh, we talked a lot about in the master plan era, specifically at the top of the hill of Dix Hill, where you have the, the core of the, well, once you, once you pull away the extras and you get down to the AJ Davis building and the, the bones down in there, um, that, that can be a really unique space. Uh, and in particular with the Raleigh climate, it could be a really unique space at night. And so when you're talking about occupying park spaces at night, it's really great to have a balance of both indoor and outdoor spaces that lend a sense of, um, of um, kind of activity and excitement and, um, and, and therefore um, just occupancy that's a little better. So getting a good balance that is really important of a site that's this, this large and that wants to be used all throughout yeah. the day and all throughout the year. Yeah, no, I, I yeah. understand the need to keep some of the buildings. I get that. But what I'm saying is, why would the city want to own those buildings? Why wouldn't they want to uh -huh. lease, lease out as many as possible? Or however we want going to use them. I think that's what we want this next phase of work to help answer. So okay. basically, we've got an idea of the buildings we want to remain. Um, there's potential future uses for those buildings that leads into this funding model and governance structure. And it's that sequence of work that's going to help us determine as a partnership, what should that governance framework look like and who should be managing the real estate assets? Um, is it the city? Is it a, another entity? And, and how does that move forward? But we need to do that work so that this group can help make some recommendations for council to our ultimately make that, that decision. Okay, can I just try to answer or a little bit more? Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we did or is we made a suggestion of some of the buildings might be just good old fashioned park buildings, you know, they're <laughs> lost leaders as I call them, you know, but you kind of, they make the park better. They make a more unique experience. One of them might be a visitor center, history center and administration. If you need, you have a big 300 acre park, you actually need a staff to run it and administer activities there and do all those kinds of things. So you have something like that. You need, there are buildings that are maintenance buildings already there. So boy, wouldn't that be nice to have a free maintenance building? So there's those kinds of things. There's park activity centers or we saw ways of supporting uh, other programs that could be in the park that are very park oriented like day camps and all kinds of things like that. So those are those, those are those things. Those are all, they all cost you though, right? And so right. the root of your question is how do we get, uh, you know, how do we have as few buildings that cost us anything as possible? I think that's what would come out of the study. We gave a, we gave a base guess at that um, all the way across the board. You know, like Kate said, we shucked at least half, more than half of them. Uh, and, and, then, and then in terms of the uses that we did keep that were not park buildings per se, we really looked at park compatible uses. And, and I think that we have a special privilege of having worked on Brooklyn Bridge Park and having to go through the process of developing park compatible uses there that would be revenue generating uses. And really those came down to, in that case, it came down to housing and uh, hotel uh, which both are actually supportive of parks because like Adrian said, uh, having a community of people in a, in a kind of a detached landscape, which the 300 acres is in a certain way, has its benefits just sociologically beyond any other financial connection or something like that. But that's all to be ironed out further. Thank you. Yep. So I have a follow-up question to Origins and then Alicia, you're next. Relating to that, you know, we're talking about partnerships. What kind of partnerships are we talking about? I just heard you, Matt, say housing and hotel. Um, you know, I know that anytime that has been mentioned in the past, um, there's a little bit of a dust up. So talk to me about the types of partnerships we're envisioning. I'll kick us off and then let Matt and Adrian jump in. In the master plan process, it, there was an entire range. There was a range from uh, institutions. There was a range from uh, even dormitory model. Like there was a, an entire range of uses. Um, and what we need to do is come up with the criteria to evaluate what we believe are the right park partners for the park moving forward. So we had maker space, food halls, concessions, 
nonprofit offices. And then it went to the revenue generating side, which was more on, is a hotel an appropriate use? Um, are, is housing an appropriate use? And if y'all will remember, this was the hottest topic during the master plan discussion. Mm -hmm. And so basically we just kind of hunted it to the next, to, to an, a new study. And now we're at the time we have to ask these questions again because the buildings are coming to us, because the operational costs are coming to us, we, we need to have an honest conversation about this, make some decisions about the range of uses that this group and council believe are park supportive to inform how we manage and operate this park over time. And so, um, you know, we, we, yeah, Stephen might wanna jump in here, but we, we acknowledged this question during the master plan process, but, basically said more study is needed and hunted it. And now we're at that time where we have to pick up that that football if I'm continuing with that metaphor. Yeah, Stephen? Yeah, remember that, so the master plan did a wonderful job. Essentially, it, it, it's an expression of our values as a city. We value the arts and education and public space. So it's now how do you accomplish achieving those values through these buildings by aligning with the right partners and, and a sustainable financial way. Okay, is that accurate? Basically, we said we aspire to be this. We now need the business model to achieve that value system. Thanks, Stephen. I'd just like to add one thing on that, which is going off of Brooklyn Bridge Park and other MVVA projects where we've done similar but different uh, kind of uh, partnership models. The city, the conservancy, this group here, you all are in the driver's seat really to determine kind of what that agreement with the potential partner would look like. So I understand that when um, uh, when when different when, when different building uses are brought up that it can be challenging, but really uh, there's, um, there's so much potential here for incredible partnerships. And a big piece of that as well is ensuring that whatever groups are brought in, understand and kind of have at their core um, the, the value of what the park as a public space is offering. And so uh, that's in part why some of the phasing um, that we went through before uh, was kind of leaving some of the most important buildings for last. Uh, a part of that thinking strategically was that the value of Dorothea Dix Park as an incredible public resource needs to be just sort of self-evident. So that by the time um, partners are uh, potentially being looked at for some of the, the core buildings here within the site, um, it's not something that anybody needs to be convinced of, uh, but that they're, they're, they're coming to, to this group uh, and to the other decision makers uh, for Dix Park with, um, with that appreciation um, and that um, understanding of what they're offering back uh, to the life of the park. Um, just embedded in uh, embedded in any proposal. Alicia, I don't think I ever really got an answer to my question, but um, I will follow up. Um, I had a I had a question and a comment. I'll start with the question, Kate. I may have missed it. Did you say sort of the type of consultant or or partner that you would be looking at to do this study? Um, I did not say that's a great question, but there is a group within the uh, um, School of Government at UNC Chapel Hill. They're called the Development Finance Initiative. And what they do is they help public-private partnerships figure this exactly out. And so they take a public benefit perspective and look at real estate assets within a public-private partnership and help entities like ourselves, like our partnership, figure this out. And so not saying they would be the, the group, but we've had some initial conversations with them to help us understand the question. And um, I think they would be a, a great group. They're also a nonprofit within a university. So it's an interesting, uh, potentially an interesting group to bring with us, but they do provide public benefit real estate advisory services, um, which I think would be a great fit for this project. But that scope, the specific scope of work and how we move forward there would also come back to this committee. Hi, thanks. I was curious. Um, I I just wanted to to say from from my perspective and and experiences, this is incredibly important work to have done, and you know support understanding not only how we you know execute a long term vision, but also execute a plan 
and have the framework for it to be a viable vision over future and, and be able to, to continue. And it could take a number of forms as you as you outlined, but but wanted to um, comment generally on my support for moving forward that with this type of investigatory study. Other questions from the group on this? Um, I think, Mayor, back to your question, um, there are opportunities that are presenting themselves right now, and we need to figure out how to address those opportunities. And then there's the long term, what are we going to do with all these buildings when they become the responsibility of the city? And we need to develop the process and criteria to address both of those. Kate, um, one question I've got is just the interactions between, um, and Alicia, this is maybe, you know, NC State and Centennial and all of the development plans you have, as well as the interactions between what we're doing and the state farmers market, as well as, of course, the city. Um, I got a call today from an attorney who's looking at a rezoning case on Lake Wheeler Road. So, you know, how we incorporate the larger district development plans into this study, just in, any, sort of top level comments on that? Um, Janet, I, I don't know if you already, if you saw this PowerPoint and are like positioning me for the next slide, but let me just show you this next slide. Um, so in addition to kind of the work inside our boundary, there are so many projects going on around our edges. And it's also the coordination of this larger city building effort. So here you just see um, everything that's kind of in the pipeline to date, Plaza Play, the expansion at Healing Transitions, um, the South Saunders rezoning, which is known as Park City South, the rezoning just up from that, the entire Downtown South rezoning, and additional, uh, additional transportation improvements. So the coordination of all of the development projects, for lack of a better word, um, whether they be transportation or land development that is happening around the park's edges, is extremely important for us to not only stay aware of, but to be in coordination with, because it is kind of a, a city building effort in this area of Raleigh. This area of Raleigh is under extreme pressure. Um, the edge study is addressing a lot of this, but it's, it's this coordination piece that's really critical to the future park's success as well. Glad to be able to set you up. It was unintentional. That was a true question. Can I just follow up with a question on that? Um, you know, we, we had multiple discussions during the course of the master planning um, process about value capture around the edges of the park. Clearly, the reason that a lot of this development is occurring is because we invested $50 million in a park and now we're spending tens of millions of dollars more, which makes all this land a lot more valuable. And so how do we capture some of that value increase to reinvest in the park? Uh, I don't know if Tansy or anybody, if the city has moved forward on looking at any potential for that. Marianne, do you know? I am. We have not. You're waiting for the answer. Okay. No, we, not. we looked at it during the master plan. Uh, we work with our finance department to look at um, like high level what a TIF would generate as well as an MSD, um, but we haven't done anything since um, since the master plan. Well, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, you have the opportunity during a rezoning, <laughs> they're getting an, a much higher entitlement. Um, certainly, we, we talked a lot during the master planning process about everything from properties that are on Lake Wheeler Road, helping to pay for the road, shared parking, all kinds of those things. But really, if you look at the extent of the development around this park, and we certainly heard that over and over when we went to New York, we heard from the High Line was huge, heard from a lot of other parks that as the parks were developed, 
that all of a sudden the you know value the surrounding property and there's got to be some way for us to value capture that to have it reinvested in the park that could definitely be you know when we think about this funding model moving forward that could be a component of that dfi or another entity could help us with um and i know council was having a very similar discussion at their table around development agreements and those as tools. And so I think all of that needs to be evaluated in this process moving forward. Um, but that's exactly the kind of work we wanna pull forward because these, these hard questions are out there and um, yeah, we need to get direction. Well, we also just approved a change policy. I mean, as in just approved it. So, um, you know, we now have a policy in place that we can look at, that staff can look at, and we can um, examine. And now with the TIG, it's up to the developer to come and request a TIG agreement. Um, and that has to be for in infrastructure improvements or public benefit or community benefits. So there's, there's some, a lot going on with that too. Yeah, that's, yeah. I'll, I'll just offer, I acknowledge that a lot has changed in the city since 2018 when we were last studying this, but uh, Nancy, we were looking extensively with the real estate and financial advisors back in 2018 about the potential mm -hmm. for a TIF or some kind of value capture off the Dix Park site. And at the time, it didn't seem to make much sense. If I remember correctly, it was something right. on the order of, you need 13 times as much space off site as you would on site to get the well, same support. You're right when you say that, you know, a lot has changed. And certainly if you look at the extent of that map that we just saw and you think about, you know, part of our problem is our, our biggest adjacent landholder is the state of North Carolina. So that doesn't, that doesn't help. But I think that with the redevelopment that's going on, somehow I, we have, I just think we have to figure out, you know, I'm not sure that the TIG policy which seems to be aimed more at helping with development were, is the same as what, but I, I do remember that at the time, but I still, I think things have changed. That's definitely it's, something we can- It's worth looking at. Okay. Yeah, something we can pull forward in the funding model discussion. Other questions about kind of this next scope of work and what we're trying to accomplish or the questions we're trying to answer to answer or just any reaction to the information that we just flew through. Does NC State have any um, capabilities in this area? I know you mentioned the School of Government, um, but what about NC State? That's a good question, Alicia. I don't you know, I am, I'm familiar with some of the offerings of the College of Design and the work that they're doing more on the planning side. I know they're standing up a, um, some coursework around development, what their depth is in the, in the same way that, you know, our other institution down the road um, has a specific <laughs> institute. I don't know that they're formalized, but I'd be happy to make some of those connections and have some conversations. And you know, while I'm, I'm speaking, I will reinforce, you know, our interest in, in being a part of the conversations around planning and how, you know, what we see as the future of Centennial benefits the park and vice versa. And certainly we haven't even um, dove into Spring Hill, Centennial East um, yet. And that'll be a part of our physical master planning process, which kicks off this fall. So I think there are potentially some some good alignments with the the timing of the scope of work that you're talking about as well. Okay, I'd be happy to follow up with you on that. Alicia, I was just going to say Mark Hoverston and Chuck have been great at reaching out and keeping us informed. But it, it would be great to connect with you too, so we may follow up and just yeah. Yep. Great. I just like to say I'm so glad to see all these people in the same meeting here. I think this is really good that uh, we're all talking together about this and and I think it's really important for the park that is kind of that's what's great about this this committee thinking about this now it's it's really critical.
Thanks, Kate. Um, what more do you have left? Other things, and I'll just kind of share uh, my screen again. Um, so again, just to highlight, there is a lot of development activity directly adjacent. We are actively coordinating on all of these things. And the, the idea of that this committee will help review the scope of work, will help provide direction. Um, you know, we, had, we started this discussion last time about what is the role of the leadership committee in this discussion. And what I wanna share back with y'all is we need to initiate this process to provide the information needed so that this committee can make recommendations to city council to help inform this building and partnership process, to help inform how a funding model moves forward, how what a governance model looks like. And from my perspective, it's the role of the leadership committee to be actively involved in this project development process so that this group is coming together to set the values for the park that then move forward to council for review and approval. So this, I imagine this committee, in addition to um, a subcommittee of the conservancy that's looking at this and a subcommittee of the community committee that's looking at these things would come together in this study to help define some of this criteria to move the building discussion forward. In addition, um, we are actively working on a naming rights policy. We'll bring that back to you at your June meeting. Um, the mayor already put a budget note in the discussion around the chapel fees, so that piece is moving forward. Uh, also at your June meeting, we'll be, bring back the FY2, FY22 budget request of the city to the conservancy. Um, so that will be something that we bring to this group for review and approval. And so just continuing to make sure y'all have the list of things that we're gonna need your input on in order to move the project forward. And these are just a starting point um, that we'll continue to build on. But I did wanna pause here because I know this was a discussion last time about how will the leadership committee be involved and what are those key decision points moving forward? So if there are questions around the naming rights or I think the fees are well on their way. So we may not be many questions there, but these other initiatives, we can, we can talk about those. Um, Kate, could we get a little bit of an update? Um, Cause the last meeting we had, there was a lot of talk around the arts programming. And then there was a separate meeting after that where we have moved forward. Could you just really quickly update everybody? Sure, that's a great point. Um, so after our last meeting, there was discussion on the process to procure artists early in the Plaza Play project. And staff had a follow-up meeting with uh, the Conservancy's leadership on this call because we would be seeking Conservancy funding to do this. Office of Raleigh Arts staff presented the process and got general consensus that this was a great way to hire some artists early to integrate art into the Plaza Play. Um, since that conversation, the RFP for artists has been issued and there will be people from the Conservancy, the Leadership Committee, the design team, as well as our staff and a few others involved on that selection committee. So I think that's a, that process is well underway to hopefully hire some artists early so that art is well integrated into the Plaza Play project. And this is ultimately setting up the, the percent for art funding that will come during construction. Yes, so that, that had discussion has moved on from the, the last time. And I, I thank you for getting together with the Conservancy and whatnot and, and helping to move this forward. So um, thank you with that. Um, do you have any questions of Kate or Matt or Adrian based on um, this presentation? Okay. Um, next is around the table. Any comments, concerns, um, anything you want to share? <laughs> Nancy, did you have something? Uh, 
No, I think the, I'm just looking at the notes I had made for this, which was talking about the value capture, which we've already talked about. Um, I guess I'm just, I'm a little curious. I mean, I really appreciate all the work Kate did. It's a great outline and it's clearly all these things we're, we need to do. Um, so do you have a, <laughs> do you have a plan on how we're gonna move forward on some of those things? Yeah, I think um, two things. One is the city is working on a funding source to okay. advance this building discussion. And so as soon as that funding source is identified, we're already working on potential scope of work to bring that back to this group for review. Um, and so that will move that work forward. So when you say you're looking for a funding source, you're saying you're trying to figure out how to put it in the budget <laughs> to, for July? Okay, I was just asking about timing. And well, that better move forward quick because we have our budget in front of us right now. Yeah. Um, and so if there's gonna be some funding for this in the budget, that needs to be done in the next. Um, our public hearing is June 1st. Mayor, I appreciate the offer to just, and one thing I want, thank you for your time last week um, as well, meeting with, with um, members of the Conservancy, really appreciate you and the city manager um, spending time with us. And one thing just um, as we look at all these community partnerships and I appreciate all of the um, language today around shared values, common purpose. Um, we have had a number of applications and one is, is marbles, um, as you know, which um, of course Wake County, they have a lease that's coming up and um, lo lots of moving parts. But I just, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, I think we are trying to work on an expedited time frame, you know, with them, and and just I think that there's a lot of goodwill here, and a lot of shared values. So um, just wanted to put that out on the table to see. Kate, did, was there anything else that the leadership committee needs to know about that? Or I just had an initial conversation with Marbles, and from a programmatic perspective, exactly everything you said, Janet. Their value system and potentially the parks aligns really well, and. I, hopefully what we could do is parallel process the marbles discussion with this larger building study, um, but that is something that we would look to this committee for some direction on to, to do, because um, they, they have a timeline they're working on. We obviously have this larger discussion that needs to happen, um, and so that, that would be direction that we would seek from this group or from um, council. Uh, I, think I would certainly think that if Marbles wants to come here, that would be a priority for us. Um, it would add credibility, a great complement to what we're trying to achieve with Plaza and Play. And um, it would also enable us to get some county support. So uh, I see that as a win-win. Arj? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Kate, did I understand that you hope to have the naming rights resolved sometime in June? That's right. And so, Stephen, I'll uh, invite you yeah. to speak. Yeah, we met with Janet and Amy last or about two weeks ago, and they gave us feedback on the policy and asked me to make some changes, which I've worked on and hopefully get to finish up in the next week or so. And we'll present the, the updated policy to the leadership committee. We'll also share it with the park board um, and then eventually to council to endorse the update. So um, I expect Orage to be um, at the council table at their, their meeting in July before their break. Perfect, thank you. Okay, Shauna, you had your hand raised and then David. Thank you, Mayor. Um, is this the time to ask about when the RFA or RFI, RFP process will go out for like food vendors and stuff like that? Is that part of this conversation, Kate and Janet, or because I know, you know, Wake Tech is also really interested. So as we're talking about shared values and interests, they're obviously someone we want to make sure does not miss that. So um, there are there are two things going on with the idea around concessions for the park. One is, and this is why, you know, everything is, is, is building on each other, but 
in the Plaza Play project, we have space for a concessionaire. And so we will initiate a process to bring in a potential concessionaire so that as we're designing the building, the house of many porches, they're potentially, it is outfitted so that this, or that we are designing it with it, with the concessionaire in mind. And so I think you'll see soon issued from the city an RFI or an RFP um, to determine what a concessionaire strategy might be for the Plaza Play. However, I think that begs the bigger conversation of how does an overarching concessionaire strategy align with the building, funding, and operational model. So we're doing a lot of things in kind of parallel process, which the project necessitates, but that's why it's important for us to get this overarching work going while we continue to push forward on our project work and make sure we're not precluding or missing any opportunities, for example, with a concessionaire specifically for the Plaza Play project, since that's the first thing that will come online. Okay, is that it, Shauna? Okay, David? Yes, I wanted to ask Caitlin, with respect to marbles, is this a second location or would they transition to the park? And do they have, if you know it, a timeline for that? Yeah, so they are evaluating their, their space needs and they have a lease with the county, I believe until 2023, if I'm um, correct. So I don't think this would be a second location. This would become the primary location. Uh, and they, you know, they are very happy downtown, but I think they're also looking at future growth opportunities, looking at a, a way to, you know, one of their main principles is learning through play, which is exactly what, you know, one of the principles of the Plaza Play is. So I think it would be an either or situation, but um, more conversations are needed, uh, but, yeah, I think their board is potentially considering Dix Park as their future flagship location and, and they would move from downtown. And I think that that has been confidential. Um, so if we could keep that amongst our group, um, that would be appreciated. Okay. Um, I have two items when everybody else is finished. Any other? comments, questions? Okay, um, the first I wanted to mention um, was that the Strollway project that we proposed um, for in, um, title um, for Deborah Ross, um, this is funding that um, they are trying to secure through the feds. Each um, congressperson gets an earmark. Um, so they are looking at potential earmarks. The Strollway project, which you may have heard of, it will connect um, Dix Park and Chavis Park. It is a bike pad friendly type of um, thing that would make getting to Dix much easier um, and also getting to Chavis, but it also would have history and art along the way. We have applied for a grant with the Bloomberg um, Philanthropy for Asphalt Art, so that's street painting. Um, the good news is that our earmark made the top 10 um, for Congresswoman um, Ross, and so we're waiting to hear on whether we secure that funding. Um, but that's a, a great way to improve connecti connectivity into the park. I think we've talked a lot about the fact that Dix Park was built to keep people out. Now we're trying to find ways to invite people in. This would be one way to do that and just even making it easier for with people who are downtown to find their way there. Um, so that's one bit of news. And um, when I shared this with Orage and Jim and Janet the other day, um, Orage said, that would be a great naming rights opportunity. And I, I really appreciated that because we're going to have to change the way we think about things um, related to how what we do. So thank you for that, Orange, um, duly noted. And um, I'll keep you posted on how that progresses. And at the beginning of the meeting, I asked if um, how we wanted to meet going forward. Um, 
We originally were scheduled to meet every other month. We, I had asked that we meet on a monthly basis just because there was so much going on and we were trying to kick this off. So I want some feedback from the group on a couple of things. First off, do you want to continue to meet monthly? Um, do you want to meet in person? And the third option is we could do a hybrid. We could meet um, next month in person. If we continue to meet monthly, the next month maybe we, we do a Zoom. But um, I just wanted to throw that out there and see what your thoughts were. Do you don't, want us to vote on the chat? Um, just don't be afraid to speak up. If there's a preference, just say what it is. Well, given the list that Kate just put out there, I would think we need to keep meeting every month. Mm -hmm. Yep, I agree. I was having the same thought. Yep. Yeah, I, I think the hybrid sounds good in person one month and Zoom the following month. I agree okay. with Laura. Especially because we're heading into the summer and many of us might be traveling. So having an occasional Zoom will be helpful. I think it might be nice to offer in person and Zoom every time. That way it gets to exactly what Jennifer just said, but also it gives people that want to be together the opportunity to be together. And especially if we're going to be out on campus. Um, I'm doing a lot of my walk and talk meetings out there right now for my job. So, and I've done that with the parks team. I really enjoy that. So that would be my vote is that we would consider always having in person, but people having the option to call in for those for comfort reasons and travel or whatever. Just feel like we've got to get back to in person. Okay, um, well, there's a couple of things going on here. I think what we'll do is we'll go back and um, Kate, um, I'll get with you and um, Janet and we'll see how we move forward. How's that? One more thing. I just got a text from someone who's listening in and said this is a great way to get greater public engagement and that's a really great note. I won't say who it's from, but um, that it's a really great point. So thank you for who just texted me that. Okay. All right, everyone, is there anything else? Okay, um, I just wanna thank everybody um, for their continuing commitment. And um, like I said, I feel like we're making good progress and I wanna thank everybody. So um, we will see you next time in person at the chapel. Um, and by the way, who will be at the um, ribbon cutting for um, the chapel? Um, tomorrow. I guess we'll see y'all then. Okay. Thank you very much and see you tomorrow. And if not tomorrow, we'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.